Uh, hello to all of you on the live stream for joining us again. Uh, we're on the uh, final straight this afternoon, final afternoon, sadly. Um, and uh, as a bit of a newcomer to the D language myself, you know, I've been fascinated by some of the talks that we've had over the last two and a half days. You know, in particular, all the different places that D seems to be, you know, all, all the different worlds that it seems to be penetrating, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, in the big data space or whether it's in the, uh, you know, JavaScript space even, uh, and, of course, the embedded uh, or the, the microcontroller world. But there's one place we haven't talked about uh, explicitly uh, that much, which is uh, mobile, uh, nor have we talked about the use of D in games, uh, and I think that's all about to change. Uh, so I'd like to hand over to Stefan, who's going to tell us all about building backends for games in D. Take it away. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, I hope you had a great lunch. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to tell you how humble I feel to be standing in front of so many experts. Um, I wish I would be able to. Uh, I, I would have been able to talk on day one before all the all these great other presentations. Um, so now I feel so much worse for what I'm going to tell you because I feel like um, I'm one of these guys that just uses D. You know, I'm I'm just occasionally on the um, on the forums. Um, essentially, like Maxime said, whenever I, um, I I peek into there, it's almost always because I have a problem and I need a solution. So. Um, the agenda of my talk is um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, why I'm standing here, and um, why it could be uh, uh, interesting for, for, for D, what, I'm, what I've done with it. Um, it's going to be about a game I've wrote. It's called Stack 4. Um, in part two, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the game. And um, in part three, the main part uh, is going to be about the multiplayer backend that I wrote. Um, to back up Stack Force, um, yeah, online mode. <laughs> uh, oops. And um, in part four, um, this is a, a really exciting part. Is um, it's it's pretty new since 2014. We are using D at work too. Another German company using D. <laughs> um, and in the end, I'm going to conclude a little bit about what I learned using D and what I like about it and what kind of future I see for it. So, um, yeah, I'm Stefan Dilli. I'm 28 years old. I'm programming for 15 years now. And um, I'm in the ga professional game industry for seven years. And, yeah, I'm a software engineer at Fanatics. That's the company I was talking about. Um, a little bit about the games that we developed un up until now. It's, I, I started at Fanatics uh, 2007 when we were developing uh, one of the Settlers franchises for PC at that time. And um, the next project I was working on was like kind of an embedded uh, project um, for the Nintendo DS and PlayStation Portable. Um, it was called Tom Clancy's End War. Um, and uh, after that, we developed um, a pretty long period of time on a MMO project that we wanted to um, to to develop and. Um, in that project, it, it uh, started, out, uh, started out as uh, called Funland. And once we were at a stage where we uh, wanted to, to find a publisher for it, um, we found out, that is like kind of a side story, um, that we couldn't go with the name Funland because uh, there was al uh, already a website, like porn website, about it. <laughs> so <laughs> the name was essentially gone. Um, that's why it was 24 Fun after that. And... Um, why do I mention it? It's because we were... Um, so 24.1 never was released, um, but we had to develop a fully-fledged uh, C++ server back-end site for it. And it was all working, and uh, it was a shame that we couldn't release it. But the good thing was that when we started out developing our first browser game called Cultures Online, we had this back-end, and we were able to use it for it. And... Um, that's essentially the backend that we are using up until now. Uh, we used it for UFO Online, which is another browser-based game using Unity. <laughs> and um, after that, uh, our latest project that just got a, a, a out of a closed beta stage a couple of weeks ago is called Panzer General Online. And um, yeah, 
a little bit about my D experience, um, which is pretty long already. Um, I had to, to look up when I first encountered D, and it was actually this project. Some of you may know it. It is called Tumiki Fighters. It was a game. I, um, I can't remember how I stumbled upon it, but um, I know that uh, I liked it and that I, uh, by accident, found a source folder in there. And um, I think it was back in two th around 2006 or five. And uh, I had a peek in there and found out these, uh, 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 for me, unknown uh, file extensions .d. And I thought, OK, what's that? So I, um, that's how I uh, came upon D. And um, uh, I found out that I filed my first DMD bug report in 2007. <laughs> And uh, after that, I wrote my uh, bachelor's thesis in, uh, about game development in D and what kind of a perspective I see for, the, for, for it in there. And uh, after that, only a small hobby project followed. And uh, that's essentially the time when my um, activity on the forums went back a little bit. And um, yeah, it, it uh, took me until last year that I uh, really started using D in a larger scale again. Uh, for this server backend that I that I'm going to talk about here, and like I already said, we um, we are using uh, uh, D now um, professionally and uh, in our active uh, server backend. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. Um, so what's Stack for? <laughs> um, it's pretty much uh, an iOS, Android, and uh, BlackBerry um, app. It's uh, based on the Connect4 concept, just in 3D, um, but not so much 3D as you may think. You cannot throw pieces in the inside of the frame, but you, it's essentially a huge Connect4 field wrapped upon, uh, around, a, around this uh, 3D frame that you see there. Um, and additionally to the classic mode where you just have to uh, complete a, 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 connect, uh, um, a combo of four pieces, you um, have also the so-called arcade mode, where it's not enough to, to create combinations, but uh, those combinations gain you points. And um, after 20 rounds, uh, uh, the, one, the, one, the player with the most points wins. And uh, in addition to that, there are these uh, extras that you can collect to, um, um, to make the life of your opponent worse. <laughs> um, OK, so the history of the project is, uh, I also found that out when I looked up uh, in my Bitbucket repository that uh, it's just one year and one day ago that I created the repository. <laughs> and um, uh, essentially a month later, the first release was on Android, um, then BlackBerry, and in December last year, the online mode, uh, backed up by D, uh, went online. Uh, the game at first had just the single player mode. so. Um, the decision to, to do an online mode was, for me, I, I said to, to the people, um, okay, they, are, uh, they asked me on, on the reviews why is there no online mode, and I said, okay, once I get like maybe 20,000 downloads or so, I, I start to develop this. And I, uh, after having those 20,000 downloads, I had to do it. So um, <laughs> that's how it worked out. Um, iOS is a pretty sad story, but Finally, uh, 10 days ago, the iOS version was released too. Um, the bad thing is it still lacks the online mode. So if you download it, I hope you download it. Um, the, it's not uh, integrated yet, but I come to that later. Um, OK, so the, the online mode of Stack 4. We had some requirements that I'm going to go into um, right now or, or uh, in a bit. Um, we did some research about uh, the, the avail available uh, technologies that, were, that we um, considered to use, because D wasn't um, the first choice in the beginning. Um, OK, we went with Vibe D then. I can, I can tell you that. Um, I'm going to just quickly explain to you what Vibe D is. And um, then I'm going to, into the architecture of the actual backend and some um, implementation details that I chose to show you. Um, I, I chose them before I knew how much metaprogramming stuff you already saw until now, though. So, so um, please bear with me then. Um, OK, so to the requirements. 
Um, we did some prototyping before um, choosing D in the end. Uh, so um, there was on the client side, which is implemented using the Unity engine, um, there was already some uh, kind of constraints. We had this SOC.js protocol using because uh, at the time when we started developing this uh, backend, I was using Node.js a lot at work. So um, um, yeah, the idea was, okay, we have this protocol implemented on the client side and um, Node.js supports it, and we had a prototype, like a simple chat application backed by Unity and a Node.js server to, um, to try this stuff out. So we thought, okay, we want to stick with this SOC.js protocol. Um, okay, I have to mention one little detail about that too. Um, why don't we use TCP connections? Um, it's simply because the Unity engine in the free version doesn't support uh, persistent TCP connections but it supports GET requests. So we knew we had to, to stick with long polling and uh, simple GET requests for the communication. Okay, so um, like Walter already said, speed is money. So of course we wanted to be fast and uh, memory efficient because um, this whole uh, undertaking was kind of a shot into the blue. We had no idea if we were successful with it. So. Um, the idea was that we don't want to invest into any hardware to do this. We wanted to use the virtual server that we already had, which was really, or, or is really the, the lowest end that you can imagine. It's just our server that we otherwise use for website and uh, email and stuff. So um, that was the constraint that we said uh, this whole system should be starting to run on. But, um, okay, that's it. But we wanted to be uh, to have a system that would easily be able to upscale when, once we would have the users, uh, the, the user base, and uh, and uh, the the server wouldn't uh, be enough anymore. And of course, we wanted to be fast. Um, this whole Stack Four project is just like our first uh, indie developer project. It's not. Um, it it didn't. It wasn't created at work. It was just in our spare time. So um, it was essentially for us to be able to um, implement this as, as quickly as possible. Um, we, in, in contrast to the many other hobby projects that I did before, I didn't want to learn so much in this, but I wanted to create and, and finish something finally. So that was the other con constraint. Um, okay, so um, in our research, we uh, started out um, thinking about using Node.js because, like I said, uh, I already used it a lot at work. Um, I liked it for its simple event-driven I.O. And I, um, I like the community and uh, especially the, the NPM package management system. Um, it's, you know, it's everything in there. Um, you can simply use it and uh, add a dependency and, and, and uh, it's there for you. But, oops. <laughs> Um, but it's still JavaScript. Um, yeah, I, I have a bit of a big project at work um, using Node.js, and, and it's written actually in TypeScript because we didn't want to go with JavaScript on the, um, in this pure form. And um, as, as you already saw in, in the beginning, we, were all, we are all C++ guys at work. Um, so this whole JavaScript thing was... Um, a no-go for us, and TypeScript uh, made it a little bit uh, easier to cope with. Um, so we have this huge uh, TypeScript uh, project at work, and it's still, um, it adds a, a lot of work to, to use TypeScript um, at many places because you have to create these definition for uh, files, and, um, and then again, it's still JavaScript. You know, you can always put a var in there and all type checks are gone. So, um, the last point that annoys, uh, annoyed us is this uh, callback hell. I know you can use uh, packages to circumvent that, but um, yeah, in the bare form that I learned JavaScript, um, it, it was just too much spaghetti code uh, created by that. So um, I thought, okay, we have to research other possibilities. And um, that's when we came upon Java. Um, it's statically typed, so this problem was gone. Um, 
it's proven. I mean, of course, it's, it has a huge knowledge base and community. Whatever you may imagine that you need in Java is uh, someone already wrote it. Um, and I found the Vertex IO framework for it, which essentially gave us like the uh, feature set that I liked about Node.js, this uh, evented IO. So I wrote a prototype just copying the functionality from the chat server that I already, already mentioned. And um, it looked promising. We, um, the code was, was great. I, I love to code in Java. It's almost only code complete, code complete. Um, but the other constraint about the performance was a problem. Um, I tried to run this prototype on our um, consumer hardware, and um, it ate up all the memory that was there. So, um, yeah, I was, um, at that time, I was alone with this project. Um, and then my friend Fabian came uh, to me and said, okay, I want to help you with this project. And um, I was open for that. And um, he comes from a C++ background as well. Um, he never heard of D. And um, at that point in time, um, we both said, okay, Java is, uh, looks like, still looks like it's not the end of the story. So, um, yeah, then I remembered Vladimir's great talk from last year uh, at DConf. And I, I thought, okay, this, this Vibe framework, it, it sounded like Node.js, only that it uses a cool language, you know? So, um, so that's how we, uh, that's how we came to, to Vibe D again. And, um, yeah, I, I looked it up again and, okay, it promises us this asynchronous IO that we want to have. Um, and this so-called fiber-based approach. I'm going to show you an example on that uh, a little, in a little bit. Um, and um, okay, so we, um, we, we wrote the same prototype again in D now. And, um, oh, and um, yeah, we found out, okay, it works. It's, it's, it's using just essentially no memory if there's no user. So um, that was the, the other constraint that we wanted to get rid of. And personally, I love D since 2006. So um, for me, it was already set. <laughs> and um, the other bonus with the Vibe D framework is that it supports this wonderful REST interface. I know Java does that too, um, but you know we, we were already going into this D direction anyway. And um, since I knew that at work, our whole projects were um, mostly going into this web service-based uh, modulized implementation anyway, I knew, okay, maybe there is a possibility to sell Dean even better at work now. And, but I come to that later. Um, this is just a, a quick example that I um, try to, to show you um, some of the benefits using Vibe D versus the node, uh, versus node. It's just essentially a web server that uh, waits a second to respond and um, also uh, locks the request to a text file. It's, it's not pretty much, uh, pretty much more. But as you can see already, this is an indentation level of four at the max. So um, in comparison to the Vibe, exact same Vibe implementation, it's just one indentation level. And it looks much cleaner and simpler compared to the Node version. But um, okay, that's uh, just a simple, a simple example. But under the hood, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it makes much more, uh, the whole project much more readable. Um, but anyway, um, so the backend architecture. Um, that's what we came up with. Um, I already told you we wanted to be able to scale up the whole system once we get users um, and be able to run on this consumer hardware uh, at the beginning. So this is what we came up with. Um, we have this game servers that are easily scalable horizontally and that they, they communicate using um, a, just a standard message broker. Uh, we are going with Redis at this time because Vibe supported it just from the beginning when we started it. Um, then we have this uh, NoSQL database for the, um, for the uh, game states. That uh, the, um, this is just 
the data that, that really gets uh, written and, and read most of the time. And um, that's the part of the data that is not uh, necessarily, mu mustn't be um, totally safe. So that's why we go, went for NoSQL at that, at that point, because we were easily able to scale uh, our database at that point. We are also using Redis there. Um, okay, and you see this little MySQL database. It's still there because we have some uh, really necessary data about the users. That's just like username, login, and stuff, and uh, that's not read and write, uh, written very often, so um, we stick uh, to, to MySQL there. Um, so, so much about the architecture. Okay, so, uh, how did we split up the whole project um, for the development? There, we decided to, uh, to use this wonderful DUP uh, project that um, that I instantly loved because I, I also already loved the NPM package system for Node.js, and I think Dub is just the, the best invention over the last two, a couple of years for D. And um, we thought, okay, beside the uh, actual game server logic, everything can be open sourced, and we wanted to give something back to the community. I at least cannot write any any. Uh, Compiler patches, so um, I thought, okay, that's the most I can do. Um, so the first library that we created was um, ForeverD, which, which essentially mimics the Forever project for Node.js that lets you um, monitor your running processes and um, let it restart whenever they are gone for whatever reason. Then the basic library for all the communication between our server and the client is the SOCJS library. Um, like I said, we were going for SOCJS to be able to um, uh, still, on the, on the application level, use uh, uh, persistent connections, at least what they, they, they feel like it. But uh, below, we are having this uh, long polling system, and that's why we, we, we uh, uh, had to implement this on the D side. But it's too easy. It was just too easy using Vibe. <laughs> um, okay, of course, the SOCJS implementation on the client side. Um, okay, then we, um, we have this high score where every player is ranked, and it's uh, ELO-based. Um, maybe some of you know it. It's just the chess rating system, essentially. Um, we also um, had to implement this. I didn't find any the implementation before. Um, okay, what, what we did was um, we used the extended tiny encryption algorithm to um, encrypt the communication between server and client. Why did we use that? Um, simply because I knew it, and uh, we used it at work too. It's, it's pretty simple to implement and um, also uh, pretty fast um, in encrypting and decrypting. Mm. And as long... As you, can, as you have a secure channel to exchange the keys for this encryption, it's, it's uh, sufficient for our needs. Um, okay, so we are exchanging the, SS, uh, uh, the, the keys via SSL, and after that we use the fast uh, way with uh, XTA and just um, uh, ordinary HTTP. Okay, and then one of the biggest things uh, we had to implement was um, Okay, this is, uh, uh, was before I knew that Amazon had this uh, nice uh, binding to be able to uh, simply pump messages to uh, Android and iOS devices, so we had to implement that. But anyway, we had this constraint that we don't want to pay for anything that, until we know that this project would be successful, so um, that's why we went to implement this by ourselves. GCM is essentially the Google Cloud Messaging and APN is the Apple Push Notification Service. Um, yeah, the, the Google version is fully running and we are using it uh, on Android, but the application version is, it's just a nightmare to implement because it's a really, um, it's bit-based uh, communication and the documentation is really bad. So um, that's the, the reason why uh, the online mode isn't uh, already working on, I, uh, on iOS, and it's uh, released without it up until now. Um, 
yeah, you find all these libraries on GitHub if you want to. Um, and on, of course, uh, using DUP. And um, I want to go into some of the examples now. Um, the first one is, a, is pretty simple. Um, we, have, we have this, uh, this Splunk analytics service that uh, simply gets fed with um, syslog formatted log files. Okay, the, the problem is we want to analyze what the, what the, what the players are doing. We want to be able to uh, optimize the game in the way that uh, the players like it even more. <laughs> so um, that's why we have this analytics service. Um, but the thing is, I, we, we also use it at work. So I know that I already wrote like in, in three different languages the, uh, the stuff to, to uh, format our lock uh, messages in the way that Splunk wants it. So um, at this time, I thought, okay, now I'm going to implement a web service based uh, for this. And um, the, the, our D server uh, service at, in this example uh, use this method to um, pump those messages to the web service that essentially locks the stuff away in the correct format then. So in the first version, uh, since you can simply put any kind of param parameters uh, into this log file, I just gave it a, a associative array and went for that. But as you can already see, this is going to mess up your code a lot because you still have to convert the variables uh, and stuff. So um, this might be too easy for you guys because you're all <laughs> these experts, but for me, it was like, whoa, okay, I can use this meta programming stuff, and I felt totally smart. Finally, uh, being able to, to use templates. I mean, I'm using C++ for, for a lot of years, but um, I never came to implementing more, more than generic uh, containers with it, so um, I must be honest there. <laughs> but in D, I, I used templates, and I thought, wow, you can really do that. <laughs> um, okay, what it does is it's essentially um, having this uh, variadic template that uh, does all the two-string conversions for me and puts it into a static array. And okay, I, I, I snipped away the actual logging there, but it's no magic anywhere anyway. Um, but I think I, I, I like it. It's, it's so much more simple and clean. And... Um, the next example, uh, also a little, just a little thing, but for me it was, uh, um, there was actually a bug in there in the before version before, so that's why I came to think, okay, how can I uh, optimize this to be able to, to be sure that there's no bug in the future anymore? So I had this um, comparison of two uh, sys dates, uh, sys times, um, essentially for the log service again. Um, uh, because in some versions I want log files per hour, and in some versions I want to have uh, a log file per day. So, um, yeah, I, I compare the, the last time that I wrote uh, to the log and the sys time from now, and try to find out if I have to start a new log file. And, um, yeah, what I did is uh, I, I created this equal components template again, Again, variadic templates. Um, I, I give it. I, I feed it with the. Okay, this is mix in ugly stuff. That how I learned now. <laughs> but um, for me, it's it's working perfectly. I, I just put in the the members of the struct that I want to compare. Um, but I think I learned in in one talk uh, the day before yesterday that I could do this completely without a mix and using this get members traits to to yeah. Okay, I have. I'm, I may be go, going to optimize that, <laughs> um, but it's it's working great because it tells me at compile time if this member is not there, so no problem. Yeah, and the last one is um, really at the lowest level of our communication between server and client. Um, like many other architectures, this whole thing, even though it was just a couple of months of development in our spare time, it grew. So. Um, at first, I thought, okay, I, I'm just using strings here. It's, it's, it's easier to debug and stuff. So in the end, I was using strings still. <laughs> and the code was littered with this, uh, 
with this stuff you see in the before part where I um, get in an array of strings with commands uh, from, the, from the client and I try to find out if there are in the, the correct number of arguments and I have to com um, uh, convert them to the correct uh, type and to check if, it, if, it, if there was an error and stuff. So um, when we finally had to implement this, uh, the client also in D to be able to do load testing, um, yeah, we, uh, we found out, okay, let's re refactor this. And so what came out was this parse message um, template that I feed with a simple struct that defines the parameters that I'm expecting. And um, it does all the heavy lifting for me. It uh, checks the, uh, the, the count of uh, the argument, does the conversion, and simply throws me an exception whenever there is uh, some problem. <clears throat> Uh, okay, I'm not going to show you the actual implementation of the parse message because it's just too big, but it's using um, mixings all over the place again, and, um, but whoever wants to see it, um, I'm, I'm there for the rest of the day anyway. Um, okay, so how do we use uh, D at work now? Um, um, luckily, my my um, my boss. I mean, for the last like seven years, I, I already I. Whenever there was something that someone hated about C plus plus again, I always poke in there and said, "Oh, that would be so much easier in D." Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, that was simply not enough, I guess. Um, then I wrote this the, my thesis about it, and it still wasn't enough. But when we finally had to uh, use Node.js at work, um, and even my boss had to use it, uh, he said, okay, we need something better for this. And then I, uh, of course, I, when, when the development of Stack 4 started, I always showed them stuff. And, and, and with, whenever I had this fancy metaprogramming stuff where I felt totally smart, I, I came at work and said, hey, look at this. This is totally cool. And... Um, um, when, when, then I, um, then I, someday I told them, hey, I'm getting this opportunity to talk at Facebook about my project. They finally considered r uh, taking a really closer look at D <laughs> and said, okay, uh, present it to us. So I did. And um, at that time, we were uh, starting to um, convert or, or port our Cultures Online game that I was talking about to iOS. Um, and we also got rid of our um, oops, of our uh, binding to the publisher and were um, essentially starting to publish the game for ourselves. So we suddenly had to um, implement our own user system, user management, and all this stuff. So um, we were um, we had this need for a website that the users could use to uh, create accounts, change settings of their accounts, and um, up until now, all our server backend was um, behind all those hardware firewalls and stuff, and nobody was able to actually mess with us. So um, we suddenly had to open up to the website for, for this. And um, that's where my, um, <coughs> sorry, where my boss said, okay, that's uh, a good experiment for D. Let's use D for this. Um, so we implemented this uh, so-called web API for this. It's uh, also essentially just using Vibe D, and um, it, it fills the gap between uh, the, the website and all the stuff that the users can do with our backend. Um, and, and it's essentially, f um, uh, if someone messes with it, okay, it crashes, so we start it again. No problem there. And um, with the, um, I, I already told you the, the performance uh, uh, gains that we had using D for our prototypes. I, I also showed them to to my boss, so um, he was convinced that it's that it's the right choice for us. And um, after I, I showed them in this presentation um, how to code in D, he was already uh, sold because uh, it looks so much more uh, so much like C plus plus, and he hated this uh, JavaScript and TypeScript stuff anyway. So. Um, yeah, so um, we, we have this web API running now. And what we also have is uh, the so-called login API, um, which is uh, another thing that um, 
is necessary because we are using uh, we are uh, having cultures yet uh, now on um, on iOS. iOS has this um, interesting kind of way to uh, authorize uh, the users. Um, so you don't want users on iOS to to have their uh, to to create a, an account using uh, username and password and stuff. So you use this game center, and um, it's supposed to be uh, the solution to all these problems. But what they what they do is they give you a unique ID. That's fine, but they don't give you any way to authorize it. So again, we have this. Um, this place in our backend where uh, we essentially have to trust the client that this uh, user, API, uh, user ID that we get is, uh, is correct. Um, and it's a weak spot, so um, any, uh, you could simply uh, find this API and flood us with uh, fake user accounts. So we needed something that uh, would, again, be, um, be easy to scale for us. And, um, that's where D came in again. Uh, the client config API is simply, uh, it's simply the same. It's just that the client uh, gets information from there uh, whenever he starts the, the game. And so we are able to uh, configure some, some stuff on the fly. And the syslog service that I was already talking about. Okay. Oh, I'm much faster than I thought. <laughs> um, what I what I found uh, implementing all this in D is um, the performance really rocks. I mean, it was the selling point for for us using it at at work now too. So um, I think there must be something to it. Um, but um, I think we are we are just scratching the the surface there because um, I mean we really didn't optimize so much about this back end. And, and still, I mean, I, I see these presentations about running D on the uh, ARM Cortex processor, and I think, okay, it's absolutely the, the right decision to use D here, because whenever we have this need to optimize there, we are able to do it. Um, that was mentioned before already, it's build speed. I mean, I never used uh, D1. Maybe I used it for short, but I think I, I started out using D at, at uh, right at the beginning, but anyway, I, I'm still stunned by the build speed. I mean, um, our other backend, uh, the C++ backend that I mentioned, it's like it's still still really like this cliche of okay, I'm gonna build and grab a coffee. <laughs> and with D, it's it's uh, always just build ready, build ready. Even though I'm using make sense, maybe I'm not using enough. <laughs> Um, okay, what I, of course, I already mentioned that it's syntax is totally uh, familiar to us. And the templates, I, I, already, I already mentioned that. It, they make you feel so smart. I love that. Um, oh, and MonoD. I mean, I know the MonoD guy. He's a German, too. So um, I, uh, when I started out developing the, um, uh, the Stack 4 server backend, I, um, all these years I used Visual D. Um, and I was pretty okay with it, but um, when I started to using MonoD and it uh, finally worked, I mean, I, I looked into it uh, all, uh, every couple of months uh, before, but uh, I always had some problems. But then when I finally had to develop this backend, I, um, I had the need to report every bug that I found, and I did. And he fixed it like always like five minutes later. So that was really perfect. Um, uh, okay, I think I'm the only one who raised their hand last time when, I, when the question was who uses MonoD, but I can only tell you it's, it's really great. And I'm, as I already said, I'm not this kind of a hacker who uses just the command line for every stuff, so um, I'm used to Visual Studio, even though it's also shit, but it's, uh, it's the best out there for us on Windows. So um, Yeah, and of course, Vibe D and Dub. I mean... Um, Dub is, uh, I already mentioned that, I think it's the, the best invention for, for D in the last years. And I think um, for this, for this uh, Aurora project, I think it should go on Dub. <laughs> uh, I mean, the release cycles of, of, uh, 
of the DMD compiler and stuff, it's it's also great. But um, I think uh, you have much more flexibility uh, if you, if it's on DAP. Um, Oh, okay, and to, to quote uh, Andre, on Andre um, we essentially had an itch and found that D was the best tool to scratch it in this case. So, um, so much for that. Yeah, nothing too new here. <laughs> like I said, even though we are not, uh, we didn't optimize, we didn't have to optimize so much there, uh, it was obvious that the GC was uh, in many places a problem. But, of course, uh, in almost all the cases, we were uh, essentially using it, not in the best way. So we were able to um, optimize that away. Um, the next biggest problem was exceptions, but I, I hear that this was optimized in the last couple of months. I don't know. Um, VibeD heavily relies on exceptions. And whenever an exception was created, uh, I think Adam already mentioned that there was this whole lot of stuff uh, done that wasn't, wasn't really necessary. So maybe that's uh, become better now. Um, what really makes me sad and uh, also glad to hear about this Aurora project is the, the GUI situation. I mean, I'm, I'm toying around with D uh, for a lot of years now, and I use it for everything, wherever I can uh, cope with a, a command line interface. But when I need a GUI, I still have to resort to C sharp and uh, WinForms, essentially. Um, so that would be really great if, they, if we have something portable there um, that's easy to use. I know there are a lot of approaches, but I, like I said, I'm. I'm simple, and I wanted simple, and, a, and they weren't really simple at all to use, for me at least. Um, and debu debugging on Windows. I mean, there's this Visual D uh, uh, crazy uh, converter uh, who converts the debug information to uh, the Microsoft compatible format, um, and it works. But as I said, I'm using MonoD as an, an IDE, and um, it doesn't let you uh, debug on Windows. So that's the only reason why I still use Visual D for the debugging. I always have to resort to, that, to it. <clears throat> so um, in conclusion, what are the, my future directions for D? Uh, of course, for Stack 4, I, um, I'm going to uh, implement the iOS. I, 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 f I will finish the iOS port so that um, uh, so that the uh, iOS people can also play online against each other, against the Android users as well. Um, and uh, okay, I, I have to I have to be honest. Uh, up until now, the um, the uh, online mode didn't pay off. So um, we are not as uh, uh, making as much revenue with it as we hoped. But um, in the end, that's. What we were aiming at that this is that this wouldn't be a problem, so whenever there are no users at all on our servers, we are paying for no uh, CPU power so um, that's that's okay. Um, I see it much more as an investment into the future that we did there because uh, the whole architecture that that we developed is um, uh, i mean the the actual game logic is uh, such a small part in it and um, we are able to, to use it for any kind of uh, online uh, multiplayer mode for any kind of game in the future, too. So that's great. OK, um, D at Phonetics. Um, I know that we uh, are re really happy with D at work. So I think that's, uh, that's the, the, the biggest point uh, that I want to make here. Um, I, that this whole project and undertaking was uh, made me uh, able to, to introduce D at work and to use it there really uh, successfully. And um, we, are, um, we are essentially developing all new components in our backend in D from now on. Um, and we are also considering migrating um, existing uh, Node.js services that we have uh, to D. Um, and one little other thing that I that really uh, excites me is um, a couple of I, I don't know months ago Amazon uh, 
uh, announced this AppStream service that essentially lets you um, calculate whatever application on uh, in the cloud and um, essentially stream the the visuals to whatever kind of device you can imagine that runs uh, that they support and they support pretty much everything like uh, what what not uh, platform for smartphones and TVs and um, yeah and uh, since uh, the Aurora project is starting now I think that would uh, in the future enable us to um, run the whole the whole chain of the game in the uh, uh, written in D uh, would enable us to to write it in D because we we would I mean that I um, I'm able to write a pretty decent uh, server in it I already prove uh, with this. But um, with something like Aurora and all the other uh, uh, front-end D libraries that exist, we would be able to, to uh, produce the whole game written in D. <clears throat> that would be awesome. Thanks for your attention, and play our other games. <laughs>
since the, the prototype in D was so much more promising right from the beginning because it's such a low uh, memory footprint there. And of course, I like D more than Java. <laughs> All right, well, I think another round of applause, please, for Stephanie. Uh, so next up, we have the lightning talk session starting in just 10 minutes. Uh, we actually have an order of uh, a running order for the lightning talks. Uh, Ali first, then Attila, then Brian, then Dragos, and then Robert. So it's in alphabetical order of first name. Or so I thought, and then... Andre told me that actually what he'd done was an MD5 hash of everyone's names, and it still came out in the same order. So um, you can either try and prove him wrong or use that as the way to remember who's up next. But uh, we'll be kicking off with Ali in 10 minutes. <laughs>